Hi, I'm Rahil Philippos and you are listening to Three Things, the Indian Express News Show. In this episode, we talk about electoral bonds. We also talk about a caste-based survey in Bihar. But first, we talk about Operation Kaveri. Last month, when a violent conflict erupted between the Sudanese armed forces and a paramilitary force, more than 3,000 Indians got trapped in the African country. And to evacuate the standard Indians, the Ministry of External Affairs launched Operation Kaveri. It marks one of the biggest evacuation operations executed by India in recent times. That was the Indian Express's Amrita Nayak Datta. When we spoke to her, she told us that at times the operation also proved to be very risky. A very risky operation that uh, C-130J, uh, Super Hercules aircraft of the Air Force had undertaken, which was to rescue 121 people from a very small airstrip at Wadi Sedna. This operation happened last month. Wadi Sedna is um, nowhere close to Port Sudan. It is located 40 kilometers north of Khartoum. And uh, this was a night operation. It was uh, carried out on an airstrip which had a degraded surface. It had no navigational approach, aids or fuel or landing lights. So it was a very difficult operation to land in a small airstrip, rescue people and then come back to Jeddah. So Air Force has been undertaking a lot of uh, difficult operations as part of Operation Kaveri. Now, to know more about these challenges and how India managed to bring thousands of people home, my colleague Anvati Singh spoke to Amrita Nayak Datta. So, Amrita, can you first tell us how many Indians have been evacuated so far from Sudan? So, Anvati, more than 3,000 Indian nationals or people of Indian origin have been evacuated from the conflict-torn African nation. And uh, if you ask me uh, how many Indians are there in Sudan, There are around uh, 3,500 Indian nationals and uh, 1,000 people of Indian origin in the country. And most of them are concentrated in pockets of Khartoum and in some other cities nearby like uh, Omdurman, El Fashir, Kasala and Port Sudan. So it was very important for them. It was very important for India to take them out of these pockets to Port Sudan from where they could be evacuated uh, to Jeddah and subsequently to India. So the scale was massive. A lot of our air assets and naval assets were deployed for this and it continues to be in progress. Right. And could you talk about the logistical challenges India faced um, while executing an operation of this scale? Right, right. So it was a major logistical challenge to ensure adequate transport and buses for people to get to Port Sudan from various pockets of Khartoum for their evacuation to Jeddah. And uh, this planning and everything started around April 15th when the fighting in Khartoum began between the Sudanese armed forces and the country's uh, rapid support forces. So that's how it uh, started. And it started with the Indian embassy there first issuing uh, alerts and reaching out to the Indian community in Sudan. And, you know, they started issuing advisories. Then they started uh, this online registration process and it was also very challenging because there were power outages. There was an issue of network availability and the conflict kept on intensifying. There were multiple uh, ceasefires announced, but uh, nowhere were they completely honored. So there were uh, reports of fighting. So India set up... uh, Multiple control rooms. They set up some control room in India as well as in Jeddah and in Port Sudan to constantly monitor and coordinate this operation. And it was difficult because, uh, you know, Khartoum is um, nearly 850 kilometers uh, from Port Sudan, uh, from where they had to be evacuated. So it was a long, tedious journey to pick up, to arrange for buses and transports, to pick up different people from different pockets of uh, Khartoum and ensure that they undertook the long journey of 12 to 18 hours to reach Port Sudan. So it was very difficult that way, logistically. And Amrita, even after the evacuees reached Port Sudan, the logistical challenges didn't stop, right? That's right. So yes, it was difficult. And once people were brought to Port Sudan, from there, I would say this involved um, also making different facilities at Port Sudan. For the Indian nationals to ensure that their documentation is completed before they could be evacuated, 
and also there had to be transit accommodation which had to be arranged at jeddah for people who were coming from sudan it also involved coordination with the resident commissioners of uh, different state governments in delhi to facilitate the onward movement of indians returning from sudan to their respective destinations so it was uh, quite a complex operation and it was totally coordinated by the ministry of external affairs Okay, and Abrita, in the beginning, you told us about this risky nighttime evacuation process. Did we see any other instances like this during the entire operation? So earlier this week, there was this operation by a C-17. That aircraft flew directly from Hindon, and it flew through the night to land in the early morning hours at Jeddah. It refueled at Jeddah. It undertook a non-stop flight from Jeddah to Sudan and came back to India. Since it did not have the permission to land on in Jeddah while coming back, so it evacuated people from Sudan and it directly flew back to India. So this was a non-stop twenty-four hour operation, which was very very significant. Right, and apart from the on-ground challenges and coordination, there are also efforts going on at the diplomatic level. so that operation kaveri is executed more smoothly could you talk more about that so i would say that uh, yes because the entire operation is being coordinated by the ministry of external affairs a significant amount of diplomatic uh, efforts were put in to ensure this operation is carried out successfully minister of uh, state in the ministry of external affairs v murli dharan he was at jeddah to receive the stranded indians uh, nationals coming in from port sudan then foreign minister s j shankar he had spoken to his counterparts and in key partners such as us uae saudi egypt and uk and also with the secretary general of the un on uh, the issue of bringing back indians from sudan and india was also in touch with both the fighting parties in sudan so as to ensure the safe evacuation of people coming from khartoum and other places because um, there was a lot of fighting going on and there were a lot of uh, ceasefire violations happening as well and uh, while it has been extremely successful so far one indian national albert agustin he was killed after he was hit by a stray bullet while he was already there in sudan so this did not really happen during an operation but this happened and next we talk about electoral bonds now for those who may not already know this Electoral bonds are a way through which anyone can anonymously donate money to a political party of their choosing. Incidentally, these bonds were implemented in 2018 to actually make electoral funding in India more transparent. Now, last month, the Indian Express filed an RTI to find out how much money has been transferred through electoral bonds since they came into effect. And this month, the paper received the data about the funding. To tell us more about it, The Indian Express's Damini Nath, who filed the RTI, joins my colleague Ucha Sarman. Damini, can you first tell us exactly how electoral bonds work? So the electoral bonds are bearer bonds, which are sold by the State Bank of India for any Indian citizen or corporate that's registered in India. So the electoral bonds basically allows any Indian citizen or corporate to donate money to a political party of their choosing. So there are 29 branches of the SBI which have been authorized to sell these bonds. and the bonds themselves do not have the name of the donor or the recipient on them once a bond is bought it is physically handed over to a political party which is then required to encash it in its dedicated bank account for this particular purpose only the bond is valid for 15 days from the date it was issued and they are sold for 10 days each in january april july and october of every year plus for an additional 30 days in any year which has a lok sabha election and 15 days in a year which has an assembly election the finance ministry announces the dates of these sales a few days in advance every time and from the launch of the scheme in 2018 till now about over 12000 crores of bonds have been sold in 26 tranches and can people donate their money to just any political party or uh, are there specific requirements uh, for parties to be able to receive the bonds Yes so there is a, a sort of general broad guideline that any political party which has received at least 1% of the total votes in the previous lok sabha or assembly election they are eligible to receive electoral bonds the parties have to open a special bank account with the SBI for this purpose they cannot take it in any other bank account Right and what was the reason that the government first decided to introduce them into the system 
Yes, so the goal of the government was to make political funding more transparent. Their idea was that because people tend to use cash to donate to political parties, they don't know where these funds are coming from. If there is a scheme which enables the donor to, you know, give large amounts of money through check or bank transfer, they would feel more secure and this information would of course be with the tax authorities as well. Okay, now you filed an RTI recently uh, to find out more about these electoral bonds. So what was it that you wanted to find out? So the finance ministry, which is uh, the one that runs this scheme and has notified this scheme, every time it announces a tranche of sales, it uh, you know gives a list of branches where the scheme will be applicable, the rules and who can apply and how the process will work. But once the tranche is complete, the finance ministry does not release details of what actually happened, how many you know people bought the electoral bonds, the amount of uh, money that came in through this process. So after the completion of each round the RTI route is the way to get the information and the most recent round was held in April from April 3rd to April 12th and the RTI that I filed was to ask for details of the sales and redemption in the 26th tranche which is the most latest tranche as well as the overall data of uh, sales and redemption from the beginning of the scheme till now so what we learned was that overall 12979 crore in electoral bonds have been sold so far and about 90% of this was sold in just five cities which is mumbai calcutta hyderabad new delhi and chennai and when it comes to the redemption almost 65% of the total amount in cash by parties was in the new delhi branch right so the five states you mentioned uh, mumbai uh, delhi kolkata chennai and hyderabad uh, people from these states uh, bought the most number of bonds and uh, the most number of bonds that were encashed uh, were in delhi so what stands out to you about this So since the scheme is meant for anonymous donations we don't have the details of the donors and the parties because that is not covered under RTI from the RTI reply all we know is that 25 parties have opened the bank accounts required to encash these bonds and from seeing the pattern of the sales we can see that the big cities account for about 90% of the political funding in the country and when it comes to redemption since 65% of the bonds were encashed in delhi it points to the national parties which are based in delhi but because it is an anonymous scheme we cannot be sure okay damini this anonymity uh, that comes with the electoral bonds this has been criticized a lot right Yes so almost immediately after the scheme was announced that it has been criticized some ngos uh, like the association for democratic reforms and common cause as well as the cpim went to the court challenging the scheme in 2017 itself the petitions are pending with the supreme court as of now and the critics of the scheme they say that it is opaque and there is no check on the uh, source of the money so where this money is coming from is it black money is it foreign funding there is no uh, check on that So some people have even questioned if this entire scheme is being used or can be used to launder money or funnel foreign funds into Indian politics. And finally, we talk about a caste-based survey. In January, the Nitish Kumar-led Bihar government kicked off the first phase of its ambitious statewide caste survey. For years now, Nitish has been one of the leading opposition voices calling for a caste-based survey at a national level, a demand that the center has repeatedly denied. And Indian Express's Santosh Singh says that the reason behind him conducting this survey appears to be political. Nitish Kumar has been looking for a political plank. How could he contest the BJP's agenda of, say, Lavarthi Yojana, Narendra Modi's personality? and bjp hindutva card and the patriotism or nationalism whichever you call it so all the socialist party not just jju they had been exhausted of agenda they had been exhausted of secularism they had been exhausted of mandal politics and quota politics so they had been looking for some kind of inspiration and the bihar based caste census could have been one potential plank for nitish kumar so that's the political background that he often say the caste census is sabka bhala hoga and uh, then we can uh, formulate policies this is his uh, reason on the face of it but otherwise the reason he says seems politically motivated 
Now, as part of the survey, the Bihar government has been collecting data from about 29 million households on a number of socio-economic criteria, ranging from employment and education to marital status and land ownership. But just 11 days before the survey was to be completed, the Patna High Court on Thursday stayed the survey. Here, Santosh tells us the reason behind the High Court's decision. First, the court wanted to ascertain whether it is census or survey, and then explained it very well, quoting from the Webster Dictionary and other dictionary meaning of the survey and census. And the court concluded that it's a census under the garb of survey, and it's the exclusive domain of union parliament to conduct census, not the state. That was point number one. And then there was question of uh, data security and privacy matter. If you are asking some 17 questions about the one's religion, caste, family. So, uh, court said it could infringe upon one's privacy and also the uh, data security uh, matter is also involved. Third point, a state government asked the state government is spending some 500 crore on it, whether there is a legislative sanction for it. Court asked uh, the Advocate General P.K. Sahi, why didn't the government formulate a law? Now, this order came after six petitioners challenged the caste survey in the High Court and they pointed out some significant lapses. Notably, one of the petitioners, a 32-year-old trans activist named Reshma Prasad, had objected to transgenders being categorized as a caste. There are 216 categories, 215 castes and one others. That makes it the list of 216. And it is one of transgender and uh, eunuchs, hijra. They are put under caste category. That the C is saying we are no caste, we are genders. Put us under gender category. And the Lohar community of the entire Bihar also has been protesting against it. And they are saying that government has put a list saying that we are Kamars. They have put under the bracket of Kamar. Kamar is carpenter. How can we be Kamars? We be Kamars when we are blacksmith. So when we get the caste certificate, the, our caste certificate would read Kamar, which we are not. So that's why they boycotted that census on most of them, not all of them. They boycotted the census saying that. And if they said, if they were categorized under the Lohara or Lohar, then that becomes settled tribes, which is also not correct. So the Lohar is saying that we are not on the list of 215 castes in the list. And Santosh says that the High Court's interim order based on the petitions was a major setback for Ditish Kumar and his Janta Dal United government in the state. The response is, of course, uh, embarrassment. Uh, it's a big ticket legislation. Government uh, felt very embarrassed with it and uh, they had to file a counter affidavit and taking into all the questions posed by the court. Even if the, suppose if the court... Uh, gives a go ahead, uh, it will be with so many riders, I guess. Or else, if they reject it, stand by the disorder interim order, then the state government would have no option but to move Supreme Court. And it is important to note that this is not the first time that the Bihar government has faced legal hurdles while trying to carry out some of its key legislative and administrative decisions. It happened uh, multiple times in recent past. If you start from the liquor law was passed in 2016, April 1st, then it was revised. And then first it was called the Excise Act. Then it was Bihar Excise and Provision Act 2016. In April, they revised it. And then there was so many, I think, three amendments, so many scale downs. Also, last year on the civic polls, there was a clear guideline of Supreme Court to set up a dedicated commission to know the backwardness of uh, OVCs in uh, the voters and the candidates in civic and municipal polls. But the government went ahead without uh, setting up a dedicated commission. They got the reprimand from the Supreme Court. Then they had to set up the dedicated commission. So I think last six years, uh, at least four occasions, uh, uh, government had to face embarrassment from the court. You were listening to Three Things by The Indian Express. Today's show was hosted by me, Rahil Filipos, and written and produced by Ucha Sarman, Anviti Singh, Shashank Bhargav, and me, Rahil Filipos. It was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone who you think would like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can also tweet us at Express Podcasts and write to us at podcasts at 